Hello all and welcome. We're doing things just a little bit differently this month since we usually do a live webinar on the last Friday of the month and this falls on a holiday or the day after, um, I suppose. This webinar has been pre-recorded so that everyone can enjoy a safe and fun Thanksgiving. My name is Jenny DeVries and I am the training facilitator at the Rocky Mountain ADA Center and I wanted to say thank you for joining. Now let's just get started. For maximum accessibility, I will be reading off these slides word for word and then adding in any subsequent information at the end of each slide. So the information, materials, and technical assistance provided today are intended solely as informal guidance and are neither a determination of your legal rights or responsibilities under the ADA, nor binding on any agency with enforcement responsibilities under the ADA. The Rocky Mountain ADA Center is operated by Meeting the Challenge, and we're funded through a grant from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, also known as NIDLER, and it's there to help us provide technical assistance, training, and materials to the Rocky Mountain region, which is Colorado, Utah, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming on the Americans with Disabilities Act. We are one of 10 regional ADA centers. So the Rocky Mountain Center serves region eight. And to reach our center, all you have to do is call that number on the screen, 1-800-949-4232. And that's the number you'll call for any kind of technical assistance or TA as we like to call it. And TA is a large part of what we do. We're here to help interpret the ADA for government officials, employers, small businesses, et cetera. And we're here to answer any tricky questions that you might have. It's the reason why we're here today. And for networks, we have a strong referral network um, and access to important entities within the ADA, like the Department of Justice and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And we can refer people to our contacts within the network. For conducting research, part of our grant funding requires that we do research. For instance, we're doing a fascinating study on how implicit bias affects people with disabilities. For training, which is what we're doing now, we offer training on all aspects of the ADA, from etiquette to service animals to government's responsibilities under the ADA. For publishing and share materials, we have a wide variety of online trainings if you're interested, as well as we create blog posts addressing different aspects of the ADA. And finally, we have a very strong social media presence. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. Our learning objectives today are to discuss the most common calls, emails, and online requests from those in Region 8. We will review common questions about employment, program access for Title II and service animals, to name but a few, and we will provide resources to those TAs. So if you would like to send in a question, my contact information will be at the end of this presentation. And some questions or concerns may not arise until later after you've digested the material. So please know that this is just the first step in the learning journey, and we're happy to talk with you more outside of this webinar. Before we dive into the most common questions this month, I'd like to just take a moment to review titles one, two, and three of the ADA, as well as address the other two common topics that we received. So title one prohibits employers, state and local governments, um, employment agencies, and labor unions from discriminating against qualified individuals with disabilities in all parts of the job application process, hiring, firing, advancement, compensation, training, um, and just in general, any other terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. And employers must provide reasonable accommodations to employees with disabilities when necessary to complete the essential functions of a job. And this month, we'll be specifically addressing filing complaints, exceptions to Title I, and general guidance for people with disabilities when they're requesting an accommodation. Title II applies to state and local entities, and it protects any qualified individuals with disabilities 
from discrimination on the basis of disability in any services, programs, or activities that are provided by the state and local governments. And today we'll specifically cover facility access and parking. However, um, important to note that this month we did see a lot of crossover between Titles II and Title III. And Title III, you may ask, um, prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in the activities of places of public accommodation. So this will cover businesses that are generally open to the public, such as restaurants, movie theaters, schools, daycare facilities, public recreation facilities, or doctor's offices. And these accommodations must reasonably modify their policies, practices, and procedures in order to accommodate customers with disabilities. Also falling under the ADA is service animals, effective communication, and the final topic we'll cover is COVID in the ADA. Now service animals have a specific definition for titles two and three, but not under title one. And if that doesn't make sense quite yet, don't worry, we'll dive far more into that later on. For effective communication, this will apply to anyone who has vision, hearing, or speech disabilities, also known as communication disabilities. And it's because they use different ways to communicate. So for instance, someone who is blind may give and receive information audibly rather than in writing. And on the other side, someone who is deaf might give or receive information through writing or sign language rather than through speech. And regardless, the ADA requires that both Title II and Title III entities communicate effectively with people who have communication disabilities. And the overall goal for the effective communication requirement is to ensure that communication with people with disabilities is equally as effective as communication with people without disabilities. And then like Title II, Title III requires newly constructed or altered places of public accommodation, as well as commercial facilities. So anything that's privately owned, non-residential facilities like a fair factory, a warehouse or an office building, all must comply with the ADA standards in regards to barrier removal. Now, addressing Title I TA specifically, the first question I thought would help break down some of these concepts was how can I file a complaint against my former employer who has not made accommodations in the workplace? Now, every employee or even applicant for a job has the right to request a reasonable accommodation. And if the employer is not fulfilling their responsibility, then it's going to be within that employee or the applicant's rights under the ADA to file a complaint. So the law requires you go to the EEOC or the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission first before contacting a private attorney. And then your next step will be requesting a right to sue letter. It's just the next step in the complaint filing process and it gives you the right to begin the legal process to determine if discrimination has occurred. The second question was, I have an employee who has a drinking problem and wanted to know if they're covered under the ADA. So alcoholism and drug addiction is not considered a disability. However, depression or anxiety might qualify. But anyone who is currently using drugs illegally is not protected by the ADA, and they are allowed to be denied unemployment or fired on the basis of use. And the ADA does not prevent employers from testing applicants or employees for current illegal drug use or from making employment decisions based on verifiable results. And so a test for the illegal use of drugs is not considered a medical examination under the ADA and therefore it is not a prohibited pre-employment medical examination and you would not have to show that the administration of the test is job related nor consistent with business necessity. And last thing is that the ADA does not encourage, authorize, or prohibit drug tests. And the third question is I need guidance on interviewing, disclosing disability, and other hiring help in general. Now, our center recently released a new video series on the ADA specifically about employment and requesting accommodations. So instead of answering the question myself, I thought that this newest video in our series would do the trick. Hello, Scout the Service Dog here. Today I'd like to talk to you about a person's options when disclosing a disability. Determining if and when to disclose a disability can be a difficult decision. 
especially for those with hidden disabilities, such as brain injury or PTSD, like my friend Daniel here. Someone may consider disclosing a disability when starting a new job, transitioning from school or unemployment, or retaining a job after acquiring a disability. Generally, a person should disclose their disability when they need to request a reasonable accommodation for the workplace. Under the ADA, a person can request an accommodation at any time. This could be during the application process or while employed. An accommodation request may be made even if a disability was not initially disclosed during the application process or after receiving a job offer. A person has no obligation to disclose a disability if it is not affecting job performance and employers are not allowed to inquire if a person has a disability or medical conditions. Many employers have their own in-house procedures that detail how they handle accommodation requests. This may often be found in an employee handbook. An EEO office or human resources department can assist with disability disclosure and accommodation requests. If that isn't available, a person can talk to a manager or supervisor directly. For an employee, making an accommodation request should be pretty straightforward. Plain English can be used to make a request, and there is no need to mention the ADA or use the phrase reasonable accommodation specifically. Once a disclosure has been made, the interactive process should begin. At this point, the employer can ask for limited information about the disability and the need for accommodations. Information about a person's disability should be kept private. The ADA requires employers keep disability and medical information confidential. Such information should only be given to managers and supervisors on a need-to-know basis. It is important to note that employers do not have to reverse any disciplinary actions that may have occurred before they knew about the disability. Employers are also not obligated to lower performance standards as a reasonable accommodation. Therefore, it is ideal that a person with a disability discloses and requests accommodations before job performance suffers or conduct problems occur. Well, that does it for me, folks. Time to clock out. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. Um, if it's something that um, is possibly creating more questions, we have an entire YouTube series on the ADA and employment and service animals. So if you are interested in that, that is under a different section of our YouTube channel. Now, there are a number of resources that we gave out this month related to Title I questions. The first is knowing where to file a complaint. So the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's phone number is 800-669-4000. Disability Law Colorado is 303-722-0300. And Colorado Civil Rights Division can be reached at 719-545-3520. Now, obviously, these are Colorado-specific resources. So if you are outside of Colorado, just give us a ring and we'll get one specific to your state. For retraining or finding a job, consider the Job Accommodation Network. We also know it as JAN at www.askjan.com. And the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation is 719-635-3585. And finally, your local independent living center is an excellent resource. Now for Title II, as a reminder, um, it applies to state and local governments. The focus for Title II is ensuring that the programs a government offers to the public is accessible for people with disabilities. And this is what we call program access. And this refers to the first question. So our government entity recently purchased a temporary building to serve as a mobile location for government services. Would the 2010 ADA standards apply or is it a matter of program access? So this is, in fact, a matter of program access rather than the standards. Um, and the standards will only apply to fixed elements and features of buildings or facilities located on sites. And we can look to the standards as a guidance to fulfill diligence in determining adequate accessibility for that program access. So for instance, the access aisle is the element that defines accessible parking. And this is the means to leave the vehicle and enter the site-wide accessible route. So car parking, for instance, would have to be a minimum of 60 inches wide. 
for the access aisle um, and two parking spaces can share a single access space, just to name an example. But like I said, another part of the Title II requirements is the 2010 ADA standards for design. Title II is enforced by the Department of Justice and the DOJ is the same organization who created the minimum standards for accessible design, which means that we're gonna cover that with this second question, that there seems to be a conflict between section 703 and 4.2.5 of the 2010 standards in the mounting height for signage being higher than the reach range requirements. Now with this question, 703 is referencing a requirement from the 2010 standards, but section 4.2.5 is referencing the 91 standards. So obviously the 91 standards came before the 2010. So you'll have to pick um, one set of standards to follow. And the way you make that decision is that the 2010 standards are the ones that should be applicable in general, unless you're performing a facility audit of an existing facility that was built to the 91 standards for the purpose of safe harbor. And I really liked this question because it makes us break down a couple of different concepts under Title II in parking. So someone who lives in the apartment above a business has a disability and is parking in the business's accessible spot, making anyone else park down the street to access that shop. Is it legal for them to use all the time? Also on our street, parking law states you cannot park in a sp spot for longer than two hours. Does that apply to accessible spots as well? And finally, if it is a private parking lot, can someone with accessible parking permit use the lot anyways? So we're gonna go ahead and break this down question by question. The only difference in how accessible parking is treated from other comparable parking is who is allowed to park in those spaces. So any other rules, laws, ordinances, or restrictions for the same provided parking will, ex will apply to accessible parking as well. So just think about it this way. If this apartment dweller was not disabled, and was parking in a normal parking space more or less consistently, would he be allowed to do so by the applicable local laws? So if he would be permitted to do so, then he should be permitted to utilize the accessible parking as well as a person with a disability. So if the local laws prevent this practice in non-accessible parking, then it will apply to accessible parking. And if the local laws do not prevent this known practice of a resident, it might be a good idea, at least for the city to consider if making additional accessible parking is reasonable or not. For the second question, the easy answer is yes. The long-winded answer is that if there is an existing two-hour parking limit, it needs to apply to all parking accessible or not. And if it, or it's not really a matter of codes because the ADA itself is a civil rights law and that prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability. So following with that um, line of thinking, the way that this is stated is on the premise of not being denied equal opportunity to participate in the programs or services provided by a, government by a covered entity on the basis of disability. So basically it's just stating that what an entity is not allowed to do. And so by understanding all of the regulations about what not to do, you can start to understand what the ADA does not regulate, which would be the equal treatment of accessible parking to normal parking. Now, nowhere in the ADA does it say that accessible parking has to play by a different set of rules than comparable non-accessible parking. So this city within the context of this question could choose to treat accessible features differently if it's providing for equal or increased access. But on the other side, it can't discriminate and impose stricter restrictions, um, which would limit access compared to non-disabled parking. So finally, for the third question, the answer is that federally, there is no stipulation to treat accessible features different than non-accessible features, other than the scoping, technical, and maintenance requirements that provide for physical access. So only people who are permitted to park in private lots can utilize accessible parking located in the private lot. Um, this means that a business would have every right to have a vehicle towed if it's parking in the lot illegally. And this would include accessible parking or people with accessible parking permits. 
The resources we gave out this month for Title II include the 2010 ADA Standards for Accessible Design, and finally, knowing your local ADA coordinator. And we can get access to these resources for you if you give us a call or an email. Now, when it comes to Title III, we had a number of questions. The first being, I feel like I'm being discriminated against by my landlord and my neighbors are pretending to be disabled to get benefits. So the ADA primarily focuses on public areas and the Fair Housing Act or the FHA applies to issues related to housing. We get a lot of FHA questions. Unfortunately, we just can't speak with authority on these questions. So it's just a common referral that we make throughout the month. The second question is how does the ADA interact with drive-by lawsuits? Um, it is an unfortunate reality of the ADA that some people try to stop by a business and point out things that are inaccessible and the businesses are slapped with a lawsuit. But the abuse of the ADA has more to do with how our legal system is structured rather than how the ADA itself is written. So when it comes to drive-by lawsuits, um, they're going against the nature and the intent of the ADA, if only because businesses need to be as accessible as possible, but persons with disabilities should try and work with businesses to make sure that it is accessible. And so when it comes down to it, barrier removal is the primary obligation for Title III entities. It's the primary obligation for businesses that are open to the public. So this means that um, any readily achievable barriers that can be removed, whether it's temporary ramps or updating your website to be accessible, um, you can find out um, what is accessible and what is not through a self-evaluation plan and a facility audit of your business. So just understand that there are a number of priorities set by the Department of Justice as to what you should make accessible first. And if you do have any questions about those priorities, give us a call and we'll help you walk through it. But just remember, if you are worried about a drive-by lawsuit, keeping records of performing your due diligence is the best defense against these drive-by lawsuits. And finally, an employee called seeking guidance on providing modifications of PPP to people who have a disability. The company is suspicious that non-disabled people are taking advantage of their policy to only allow those with mobility disabilities to utilize services. So this one is a little bit more complicated and it's more of a um, person to person question. So it's hard sometimes when the vocal minority speaks for the silent majority, as in most people with disabilities just wanna live a normal life and they're not trying to take advantage or exploit a system. But when a few people do, it can leave a sour taste in your mouth. And all that we can do to suggest here is to have that good faith effort and to believe someone. And if they do have a disability that doesn't allow them to wear a mask, offer the, them the benefit of the doubt and find a way to accommodate or to modify your policies to accommodate that person. For Title III TA resources, as a reminder, Title III entities have the general requirements of maintenance of accessible features and to remove barriers in case of alterations or new construction while also following local building codes. So if you would like to file a complaint under Title III, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Denver can be reached at 303-454-0100 or the Department of Justice at 800-514-0301. And if you need advocacy, you may consider the Civil Rights Education Enforcement Center for Legal Assistance, also known as CREEK. So service animals was a major, major topic this month. The first question that we got was how can I get a service animal or can I train my existing pet to be my service animal? So the first suggestion is to reach out to local independent living centers for resources on where to access professionally trained service animals. However, um, you may also train your pet to be a service animal as long as it meets the requirements under the ADA. The second question was, I work at a hotel and, an, um, and am unsure of the ADA service animal requirements. 
One of the guests brought in three service animals, but they're out of control and one attacked an employee. So the ADA only allows two questions to be asked about service animals. One, um, is the animal required because of a disability? And two, what work or task has it been trained to perform? However, the ADA does require service animals to be under control of the handler at all times, and they should not pose a threat to the safety and welfare of others. So this is where it's important to have a policy in place so you can deal with this proactively rather than reactively. The third question is I rent out my house and a customer told me I must allow their service animal or emotional support animal. What are the requirements? So if it's a VRBO or an Airbnb, it's usually considered a Title III public accommodation. But if it's independently operated, so it's not part of that larger network like VRBO or Airbnb, I don't think it's a Title III. Um, I do believe the network of an Airbnb or VRBO is the distinction that requires those participants to adhere to those accessibility requirements of Title III. But it may be worth reaching out to contacts within the DOJ to verify, but we do believe that this is the exception that applies. And finally, do service animals need to follow local animal licensing procedures? So yes, they do need to. Certain states, um, well, any state can choose to go above and beyond the ADA to increase accessibility for people with disabilities. Colorado chooses to waive paying for those licensing procedures, but they still must follow all local animal licensing procedures and make sure to check your local jurisdictions to see if they charge those fees or if there are other um, benefits that states are offering to increase access for people with disabilities. So some other common TAs, the first was service animals. And this is where we got the question, what is the difference under titles one, two, and three? So under title two and three, there is language specific to requiring a service animal in public place, but under title one for employment, service animals would not necessarily be required and allowed. Um, this would need to be a reasonable accommodation. And I know we have had some employers become confused with not seeing service animals under title one the same as they would titles two and three. And we always discuss service animals as a reasonable accommodation. It's a very common question. And so I just wanna be clear with employers that under title one, there isn't a specific definition of service animal like there is in title two and three, but we still talk about what is considered in ADA defined service animal and it's being a reasonable accommodation. So this often leads to the comfort animal versus service animal discussion because there isn't a definition under Title II and knowing that there definitely isn't one for comfort animal, again, we continue to talk about how that service animal or the comfort animal could be considered a reasonable accommodation. Now for masks, a question that we got was that someone was denied service in a restaurant because they have a disability that precludes them from wearing a mask. So the state of Colorado provides guidance on state mandatory mask requirements and when someone may not be required to wear one, whether it's people who are 10 years old and younger, people who can't medically tolerate a face mask, children ages two and under shouldn't wear a face mask or cloth coverings. And in this case, reasonable modifications, modifications should be discussed and documentation would probably be prohibited by the Title III entity. And just kind of circling back to this COVID and PPP question. So when you're considering providing modifications of PPP, but the company is suspicious of people taking advantage, just remember that people without disabilities do not have rights under the ADA. However, a Title III entity may not require documentation of a disability. Um, they should not discriminate against people on the basis of disability and disability should be construed to not create a demanding standard. Now the ADA and face mask policies brief is meant for public accommodations like for customers and businesses. If you're looking for legal assistance, you should consider reaching out to Disability Rights Colorado, Utah, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, or Wyoming. 
And we always, like I said, make a lot of Fair Housing Act referrals and their number at Fair Housing First is 888-341-7787. And of course, we're always here to help. You can reach us at 1-800-949-4232. So that wraps it up for me. Thank you again for joining me today or whenever you decided to tune in. We offer this month in TAs on the last Friday of every month. So keep an eye out for next month's webinar. Again, my name is Jenny DeVries. And on behalf of the Rocky Mountain ADA Center, we hope you all have a safe and, safe and healthy holiday.